Welcome. My name is Giles Peake. I'm Chief of Paediatric Cardiac Surgery at the Children's Hospital of Montefiore in the Bronx, New York. In this video, we will share the case of a newborn undergoing complete repair of transposition of the great arteries, VSD, hyperplastic right aortic arch with aberrant left subclavian artery arising from the left PDA. Preoperative investigation with CT angiography demonstrated disproportion between the aorta and pulmonary artery, hyperplasia of the right sided aortic arch and bilateral ductuses, with the right duct supplying the descending aorta. In this view, we can see the aberrant left subclavian artery arising from the left duct, which in turn arises from the left pulmonary artery. The CT scan confirmed the echocardiographic findings of two coronary arteries arising in the commonest pattern. The operation begins with a median stenotomy giving sufficient length to the skin incision superiorly in order to afford adequate access to the aortic arch and its branches. The thymus is resected taking care not to injure the phrenic nerves. An autologous pericardial patch is harvested. This will be later used to reconstruct the neopulmonary artery. The patch is suspended with stay sutures and kept moist between two saline soaked swabs. The aorta can be seen here anterior to the right, giving rise to the two coronary arteries. The much larger pulmonary artery is seen posteriorly. The great vessels and the innominate vein are dissected free of the surrounding connective tissue using electrocautery. They are then controlled with silastic vessel loops. The left ductus seen here is double looped as it will need to be occluded as soon as cardiopulmonary bypass is initiated in order to control pulmonary blood flow. Here the much larger right sided ductus is dissected free. This vessel gives rise to the descending aorta. The aortic isthmus joining the arch with the descending aorta and right sided ductus is quite small but large enough to provide lower body flow during bypass. Here you can see the right sided ductus being controlled with a black silk ligature. This is snared to prevent pulmonary overcirculation after initiation of cardiopulmonary bypass. Cardiopulmonary bypass has been initiated and the patient has been cooled down to 14 degrees Celsius. Venous drainage is from the IVC and right atrial appendage in order to reduce crowding around the great vessels. The ductuses have been snared down. As you can see the heart is almost asystolic with the hypothermia but is further protected with cold anterograde del nido cardioplegia. During infusion of cardioplegia a vent is inserted into the left atrium by the right superior pulmonary vein. The aorta is divided at the cardioplegia site. This is positioned to provide an adequate length of neopulmonary artery and correctly position the aortic arch with respect to the neoaorta. This usually means cutting the aorta slightly more cephalat than the pulmonary artery. Stay sutures are placed at the aortic valve commissures. After ensuring that the coronaries do not take an intramural course, they are excised from the aorta on generous buttons. Here we see the right coronary artery being excised. The stay sutures provide counter-traction, allowing accurate dissection. Once the initial excision has been achieved with scissors, further mobilisation with electrocautery is carried out. It is essential to fully mobilise the coronary and neopulmonary artery 
from all epicardial attachments. Here the sinus node artery can be seen crossing the roof of the right atrium. Division of these epicardial attachments is important in order to prevent kinking and twisting after the reconstructed great vessels are filled with blood. The left coronary artery is mobilised in an identical fashion. To the left of the picture, the CO2 insulfation tubing can be seen. This is used to reduce the risk of air embolus. Electrocorter is used in the coagulation mode. The machine is set to desiccate at an energy level of between 10 and 15. If the energy is set too low, it will cook the tissue rather than dividing it. However, if it's set too high, tissue division is difficult to control. Use of the yellow button in the cut mode gives inefficient coagulation of chylus vessels and collaterals. Note that the diathermy tip is Teflon coated and insulated almost to the end. Here you can see how the full mobilisation of the aorta, pulmonary and coronary arteries from their epicardial attachments will allow them to take up their new positions without tension after reconstruction. The pulmonary artery is tensioned using a right angle instrument. It is then divided with scissors. Care is taken to align the blades of the scissors with each cut to ensure a smooth edge is obtained without drifting too far in either direction and damaging either the valve or encroaching on the branch pulmonary arteries. The left ventricular outflow tract and pulmonary valve are inspected. The disproportion between the LV and RV outflows is particularly evident in this view. Further division of epicardium is carried out. The right atrial appendage cannula is now clamped and removed. The flow is reduced and the IVC cannula is snared. The right atrium is now opened parallel with the AV groove and the right atrial cannula is then inserted into the SVC via the atrial incision and snared in place. It's secured by tying the snare to the cannula. The VST is displayed and is seen to be a small inlet muscular defect. It is closed with two plegated sutures brought out through the hinge point of the tricuspid valve and then passed through the pericardium, which is then cut off to form a small strip pleget on the right atrial side. Next, the atrial septal defect is closed by continuous suture. A small fenestration of around 4 mm in diameter is left superiorly. Here you can see the tail of the suture being brought up as a second layer. Two ends of the suture are then tied together. The right atrium is then closed using a two layer technique. The first layer of backwards and forwards sutures is very rapid. Once this layer is nearly complete the flow is reduced and the SVC cannula is clamped and removed. The SVC is snared allowing the first layer of sutures to be completed. The SVC is then opened and full bypass is re-established. The cannula is then replaced in the right atrial appendage and the second layer of over and over sutures is completed. By keeping the suture line under tension, the atrium is held sufficiently closed to allow bypass to resume.
right-sided duct is now divided between ligatures. Cutting with a knife whilst the duct is stretched using a right-angle instrument allows a more precise division than when scissors are used. Note that a longer stump is left on the pulmonary arterial end as the aortic end will soon be excised. The pulmonary stump is oversewn as the ligature might roll off. The left-sided duct, which gives rise to the aberrant left subclavian artery, is also divided at this time. Having divided both ducts, the pulmonary arteries can be fully mobilised out to the first branches and a decision can be made regarding the possibility of a Lecomte manoeuvre. With the tension removed from the neopulmonary arterial stay sutures, it can be seen that the Lecomte manoeuvre is feasible without either kinking the coronary arteries or putting undue tension on the branch pulmonary arteries. Next, attention is turned to the aortic arch. The circulation is arrested and the aortic arch branches are occluded with silastic slims. Clipping and cutting them ensures that the shape of the arch is not distorted. The arterial cannula is advanced into the left carotid artery and snared in place for later use during anterograde head perfusion. Further mobilisation of the aortic arch is carried out, taking care to avoid damaging the right recurrent laryngeal nerve or any mediastinal branches of the descending aorta. The side-biting clamp is applied to the descending aorta and the ductal tissue is completely excised. The gelatinous consistency of the ductal tissue can be clearly seen here. This tissue must be completely removed because not only is it less robust than the normal arterial tissue, resulting in the risk of bleeding or tearing if it's left behind, but also it will contract in the presence of oxygenated blood and the absence of prostaglandin and result in aortic arch stenosis. The aortic arch is incised using scissors. More tissue is left posteriorly so that on the back wall of the arch reconstruction there will be native tissue and astomose to native tissue. There is little mobility of the descending aorta. However, the earlier dissection of the aortic arch branches allows the arch to be brought down to the descending aorta, as you can see here. The suture line is started at the caudal end of the incision. Anterograde head perfusion is started at this time.
Having completed the back wall of the anastomosis, it became clear that for the patch augmentation to sit properly and to match the diameter of the ascending neo-aorta, the aortic arch incision required extension for the full length of the arch. The cuts in each successive aortic segment and the radial position of each anastomosis is carefully reassessed at each step to ensure that satisfactory geometry of the arch is achieved once it's filled with blood. Note that the position for the coronary arteries has not yet been selected. The position of each segment informs the position of the next segment, as seen here, when the next section of the distal arch to descending aortic anastomosis can only be done once the position of the proximal ascending to arch anastomosis has been determined. The use of this tailoring principle continues here as we switch back to the proximal anastomosis having completed the distal. Now that all of the native tissue has been anastomosed, a small redundant dog ear can be trimmed off and the shape of the patch can be discerned. Core matrix is chosen for the arch patch. It is pre-soaked and cut to size and shape. This material is only suitable when sewn to native tissue or itself and when constructing a shape which has only one plane of curvature, excluding the tubular curve it will take when it's filled with blood. Pulmonary homograph patch would also be a suitable material for the aortic arch reconstruction, but often calcifies in the long term. The patch is sewn in starting distally. All of the suture lines are made using a 7O proline with a busy black needle. Having the same diameter of suture is important for knot security as each suture is tied as the anastomoses intersect. Having brought the distal outer suture up to the skyline, the inner distal limb of the anastomosis is started. Suture bites at the three-way corner junction must be carefully positioned to prevent a gap. Now that the inner limb of the suture line is complete, the outer limb is recommenced.
Astomosis is sprayed with fibrin glue. A swab is used to protect the coronaries. The side biting clamp on the descending aorta is removed and the cross clamp is applied. The circulation is arrested and the arterial cannula is withdrawn from the carotid and positioned in the descending aorta. The left carotid is snared. Note that the right carotid and both subclavians are still occluded. The patient is placed head down, a pump flow is restarted slowly and the clamp is momentarily released to de-air the arch. Following this the head and neck vessels are reperfused and full bypass is restarted. Here we see the snares being removed from the head and neck vessels. The branch pulmonary arteries are reflected towards the head and the sutures from the aortic reconstruction are passed inferiorly. At the top of the screen we can see the clamp on the transected left subclavian artery. The clamp time is now over an hour so further cardioplegia is given. Long cardioplegia intervals is a major advantage of the Dalnido solution. The reconstruction of the neopulmonary artery using the autologous pericardial patch is now commenced in the corner farthest from the surgeon. This is done prior to coronary implantation in order to afford better access to the space between the great vessels. Note that the suture line is not taken up the commissural post between the excised coronary buttons but is instead taken across the back of the post at the level of the annulus by taking tangential bites of the arterial wall. This saves at least five minutes and has no impact on valve function. Once the corner nearest the surgeon is reached, the suture is secured with a rubber shot and attention is returned to the farthest corner. In this case, because we intend to leave an atrial fenestration, the entire suture line is completed, as the cross clamp must stay on until the pulmonary artery is fully anastomosed. The suture is tied when the anterior commissure is reached. This makes later potential pulmonary artery suture line takedown easier as the neopulmonary artery reconstruction will be unaffected. We now return to the nearest corner. The pericardium is trimmed, the scissor cut is angled towards the surgeon in order to prevent excision of too much patch. Once the nearest suture line is completed and tied, the commissural post is resuspended within the pericardial tube using a U-stitch. The excess tissue above the valve is trimmed off. The excess pericardium can now be trimmed off. Again, care must be taken not to excise too much patch. This is done by cutting along a superiorly convex curve. Here we see the neopulmonary artery reflected anteriorly. The neoaorta has been anastomosed to the aorta posteriorly and the aortic arch patch has been completed save for its inferior margin. This allows the correct position for the coronary arteries to be ascertained. A medially based L-shaped flap is cut for the left coronary button. Care must be taken not to injure the neoaortic valve. The coronary is placed relatively high to reduce the chance of kinking, but not too high that it would become stretched. When anastomosing the button to the neo aorta, care must be taken not to rotate the coronary artery. Sutures are spaced slightly further apart on the coronary than on the aorta in order to create a sinus for the coronary ostium.
The anterior part of the anastomosis is now constructed. Here the sinus is fashioned by spacing sutures further apart on the aorta than the coronary in order to use the material from the inside of the L-shaped flap to create the sinus. Once the coronary ostium is passed, the button can be trimmed off obliquely, aiming towards the end of the last suture line. The vertical limb of the L can then be reapproximated above the coronary button. Now the position and flap geometry for the right coronary can be assessed. Usually an oblique slit is used to implant the right coronary artery. Keeping the incision fairly high on the aorta reduces the chances of kinking. Again, care must be taken when positioning the first suture to ensure that the coronary artery is not rotated. Because the aortic incision is essentially symmetrical, the sinus is fashioned by spacing suture bites further apart on the coronary than on the aorta, on both sides of the button. Creation of a sinus is important to reduce tension on the coronary ostium. Having completed the coronary implantation, the final part of the aortic reconstruction is completed by anastomosing the inferior margin of the patch to the neo-aorta. In this view, the patch looks slightly redundant, however remember the disproportion between the size of the great vessels. The suture line is completed in stages from left and right in order to keep the anastomosis balanced. As the suture line passes the right coronary, the two stitches are tied together. Here the tip of the right coronary button is being trimmed to conform to the shape of the patch. The suture line is continued, again switching from right to left to balance the shape of the anastomosis. Having completed the aortic suture line, attention is turned to the pulmonary arteries. Clamps on the branches are not strictly necessary, as the cross clamp must remain on, in this case, due to the atrial communication. However, they serve to take the tension off the anastomosis. Once the back wall anastomosis is completed, the anterior wall is sutured. Note the disproportion between the size of the neopulmonary artery and the branch pulmonary arteries. The disproportion is managed by means of a counter incision in the neopulmonary artery down to the level of the valve annulus. The position of the valve leaflets is constantly checked to ensure that they are not injured.
Both sides of the anastomosis are now the same length, allowing the suture line to be completed. Because both tissues being anastomosed have the same elasticity and the shape of the anastomosis is not complex, it is not necessary to balance the shape and tension by switching sutures. The final suture is tied down, allowing the clamp to be released after a total of 146 minutes. If the coronary reconstruction is satisfactory, the heart will usually start beating after a few seconds, even though the temperature is still 14 Celsius. This sequence is shown in real time to illustrate this fact. The heart is elevated to inspect the perfusion of its posterior aspect. The absorbable ligature on the left atrial appendage is placed back to the left side of the heart in order to prevent it bowstringing any of the coronary arteries. The patient is rewarmed and the left subclavian artery is anastomosed to the left carotid. Clamps are released to fill the anastomosis with blood in order to prevent the final stitches picking up the back wall of the anastomosis. Two right ventricular temporary pacing wires were applied during rewarming. The sternal retractor is relaxed to reduce the stretch on the pulmonary arteries. The heart is now beating well, allowing the patient to be weaned from cardiac pulmonary bypass. The right ventricular pressure is measured by direct puncture and found to be around one third systemic. Modified ultrafiltration is undertaken and an epicardial echo is performed. This shows good wall motion in all three coronary territories with some mild dyskinesia of the posterior septum and adjacent free wall, probably related to the long clamp time. Heparin is reversed with protamine and hemostasis is secured. Two atrial pacing wires were applied and the chest is splinted open. The patient is then returned to the intensive care unit in a stable condition. The chest was closed two days later. The patient was slow to feed following surgery and had transient left vocal cord dysfunction. He was discharged home after four weeks and two months postoperatively is doing well at home.